He was the voice of the Los Angeles Clippers for 40 years, and he is the author of Bingo, 40 Years in the NBA, which is available now at your local bookstore. We welcome Ralph Lawler onto Hoopsology. How's it going, Ralph? Welcome. It's going great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. And we have a tradition on the show since our show is about basketball culture and just the love for the game of basketball. So we like to ask our guests, you can take it any way you want it. Either what is your favorite basketball memory or your first basketball memory? Just what made you fall in love with the game of basketball? Well, the, the latter part first. Uh, I was a kid growing up in Peoria, Illinois, and uh, Bradley basketball was uh, a, a big time major. Uh, college program at the time, went to the NCAA finals, the NIT finals. Uh, and so as a seven-year-old kid, I started attending those games with my mom and dad and had an instant love affair uh, with the game of basketball. It's uh, it, it, it really set my life's course, really, uh, the love that I developed for the sport. And I, I'm so lucky I got to spend 40 years of my career uh, working for a team in uh, the great National Basketball Association and did a lot of high school, junior college, college games in the years uh, before that during what was a 60-year uh, broadcast career. Uh, the, the highlights are uh, so many. I, 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 the thing that first comes to mind was uh, how honored I was in my final 40th year uh, getting into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame, that would have to be the highlight. So what was your <laughs> philosophy in just creating your book? You have so much stories, knowledge. Like, where do you start just compiling that in just to, I'm, I'm sure this, the stories you have is probably larger than the book that you actually wrote. So what was this creative process like in just making it, fitting it into to say digestible book for fans to read? Well, it was not easy. Uh, I was surprised how difficult it was. But once I retired, uh, you look at your life that was so busy and so full, and it is not. And you start thinking, what am I going to do uh, to make <clears throat> getting up in the morning worthwhile? And I had a number of people suggest uh, over the years that you, you should write a book. And so I started thinking about it, but I frankly didn't have a clue how to do it, uh, how to have it make sense. Uh, I got lucky, connected with uh, Santa Monica Press in uh, the Los Angeles area, and they helped guide me through uh, how to do it, how to organize it, and uh, it was like a two-year process, uh, and it was exhausting, uh, illuminating, uh, very interesting. And as going into writing were you finding yourself just you know spending like a certain amount of time per day where i'm just going to get these thoughts out these stories out and organize later or how did they um, kind of help you with with that or, or how did you go into it well some days you just kind of flow you sit down and uh the words just uh explode uh and some days i haven't got a clue how to cover this topic and uh the publisher helped me. They would essentially interview me and record them and say, now we need a whole bunch of that. Maybe not so much of this. Uh, try to give me uh, so many pages of this. And that kind of would, would get the juices going. And uh, I would do so. Because the book, it, it's, it is part memoir. It is part history of uh the National Basketball Association, which I have seen since its inception uh, because I was a fan at just the right time. And re recall George Mikan in his first year uh, in the professional league and how he became one of my first real basketball heroes and later got a chance to meet him and talk to him. And I thought he'd be bored to death, but he was quite excited. Uh, we wound up having dinner together. Uh, before a Minnesota Timberwolves game, uh, he was quite excited to find somebody who actually seen him play. He wasn't just this old codger that would come to occasional uh, Timberwolf game. And we just had a, a great time talking, and it was a, a much of a thrill for me then as it would be for a, a young broadcaster to interview Shaquille O'Neal or uh, somebody today. Uh, so it, it, it covers... Uh, 
people I say, what's the best player or the best team? I, I just, I couldn't put that down in, in picking five players or one team. So it went decade by decade, the pre-shot clock era, the rest of the 50s, which were dominated by the Boston Celtics, the 60s, and in each decade thereafter. And uh, it gives, I think, fans uh, a, a look at basketball decade by decade from somebody who was there and actually saw it. Uh, so many of today's uh, historical observations about the league are from people that never saw George Mike or Bob Cousy or Bill Sharman or even Michael Jordan, uh, you know, play. Uh, you know, I, I was there and saw those guys, met all those guys. Uh, you know, sat down with Larry Bird and uh, Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson uh, and, and to today's group of LeBron James and all the great players uh, in the league today. So it's, it's a very unique perspective that I have, and I thought it was worth sharing. And fortunately, the publisher and uh, the buyers of the book have agreed. So much of the discourse around the sports talk radio or just, um, I guess, TV shows on the major networks is around comparing of eras. Is that unfair to do? Is that, does that seem kind of like ridiculous just because the game has evolved so much just to be, to have these this debates that we see on just, you know, a daily basis? Is that like very unfair way of just analyzing the game and just seeing kind of the overall just evolution of how basketball has been? Well, performed on a professional level. It's unfair if the people are talking about people who've never seen play ball. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is commonly the case. Yes. I think, I think you cannot compare the eras because of what you say. The, the, the game has changed so much. The rules are entirely different. Uh, when George Mikan was playing, there was a six-foot-wide free-throw lane. Six-foot-wide. And thus, you had the key, which is still used commonly as a term to describe a location on the court, but it makes no sense looking at the court today. But it was a keyhole uh, in those days. If they, they could just station George uh, at the, the basket, uh, and he'd get the ball because he was bigger than anybody else. He was 6 feet 10 and 250 pounds. And he was he just was throwing a right-hand or a left-handed uh, hook shot or turn and make a layup, and nobody could stop him because – he could just station himself right there at the basket. They widened the lane to 12 feet, uh, and he never led the league in scoring again. Now, since, uh, because largely because of Wilt, they made it 16 feet, which it is uh, today. And you've only got three seconds. You've got to get your butt out of there. Uh, so it's it's so different in hand checking and the three point line and all these things are just, it's almost impossible to change to. Uh, compare 1950s or 60s or 70s NBA players to today's because everything is different. Ralph, over the course of you know your tenure as a broadcaster and beyond, um, does it surprise you how the league has evolved you know to kind of this more, I, I guess sort of spacious game, you know perimeter basketball um, much more three-point attempts, of course. Um, does it surprise you that we've evolved to that point? Uh, did you kind of see that coming as as you were watching all of these games? No, I just in the, the I retired in 2019. Uh, this this three-point line mania has developed since then, uh, largely because of Seth Curry's uh, Seth Curry's amazing ability to to put up as many shots as he does and make as many uh, as he does. And now everybody comes into the league, they want to shoot three-pointers. Used to come in, they wanted to dunk the basketball. Uh, I, I, I think the game has become too reliant on the three-point shot. Uh, I, I favor moving the line out uh, a step, uh, mm. eliminating the corner three-pointer, which is like a layup to these guys. So a 27-foot circle go from one sideline to the other, it would not extend into the corners. Uh, I think that would make would bring back uh, some of the finer points of basketball that are lost. When I mean, we're seeing games where people, where each team is putting up thirty-five or forty three-point sh three-point shots. It's it's fine if you like to watch three-point shooters, but I'd like to watch real basketball 
which is kind of lost, I think, in today's uh, NBA. Do you think it has consequences in terms of the three-point shot being so popular? Do you think that's harmed college, high school as well? Um, do you think that's had <clears throat> larger ramifications? And also, do you see a way of resolving this in the future? Like, what would be ways? To, do you see, I guess, evolutions beyond the three-point line that would maybe prevent just seeing youngsters just you know grow up, just want to take three-point shots all the time instead of learning the fundamentals of the game? Well, I think <clears throat> the rules need to change, as I as I outlined. I think that would uh, solve the problem for now. Uh, they would find a way to ever be, become proficient shooting twenty seven point twenty uh, seven foot three pointers rather than twenty four point three pointers. But you watch high school kids or even younger than that; uh, they are shooting three point. That's just the way it is. Uh, Whatever the rules are, the, the, the players and the coaches will find a way uh, to take advantage of them. 1979 was the first year of the three-point shot in the NBA, which they used out of the old ABA. And uh, I was in San Diego with the Clippers that first year. And I, uh, we had a guard named Brian Taylor, who led the league in three-pointers made that year. I believe it was 90. Uh, he had He was proficient at it because he came in from the American Basketball Association, so he knew uh, the, the shot. Uh, most coaches didn't have a clue how to coach the shot. Players hadn't ever shot the shot, uh, so they just didn't. And uh, it took year by year by year, decade by decade, uh, until uh, everybody figured, hey, this is a weapon. You get three instead of two for it, so let's figure out ways to incorporate into our game and to develop players who can shoot the shot and they have yeah it's such a fascinating shift um i mean to your point you know we have all these three-point attempts in the game and uh, i heard someone earlier in the season uh making the comment that you know the best post footwork that we have in the league right now comes from alperin shangun of of the rockets who's a, a sophomore year player in the nba but kind of you know, speaks to your point in, in how the game has shifted and how reliant it is on the three point shot. And I, I do find myself personally as, as a fan that, you know, was raised watching nineties basketball. I miss those duels in the post that we used to get yeah. uh, quite a bit more. Um, well, well, yeah. well, back in the day, there were six, eight, 10 really good, big post players in the league. I mean, Will and Russell played against, a whole large group of outstanding seven foot or six ten uh, basketball players today. Uh, yeah, and, and Bede and Jokic are, are the two great uh, of, of the big players in the league right now. But that's really only two who are really superstar type players. Uh, and and I, I don't know why that is. I don't know where the rest of the seven footers are. Uh, a lot of them are in Europe, it seems like. But uh, the game is just, it's changed. It's not a big man's game now. It's a little man's game. Maybe Jokic and Embiid, uh, maybe that will bring more big guys back into the game and uh, allow coaches to feature them. I, I think that uh, with, with the Clippers now, that I think Zubats, if they gave him 18 or 20 shots a night, he'd be a 20-plus point-a-game scorer and a 15-rebounder. Uh, but they, they just don't you, don't, you don't feed that post guy. That's not your first option. The first option is get out to that three-point line, penetrate, kick it out, and have a guy shoot a three. I want to shift gears, and I want to just ask you about this, the Clipper fan base. And we've talked to just other announcers and just PA announcers about just getting to know each NBA city. And I just want to ask you, with the Clippers itself, what makes the Clipper fan base unique compared to the rest of the league? Well, they they have always been and probably will always be the little brothers uh, in the city to the Lakers who have all the championships and have had all these superstar players and all those uh, retired numbers and championship banners uh, hanging in the building. So the Clippers haven't won anything yet, got to the conference finals one year, uh, have been a first or second round and out. Uh, that's in the last 10, 11 years when they have established themselves really as one of the 
really good uh, teams and good franchises uh, in the league. But uh, the fans, the early fans were uh, underdog fans. They, they enjoyed rooting for the underdog. And uh, plus, in, in the old days, the old uh, L.A. sports arena, fans could go see NBA basketball for half the price they could at the Forum uh, with the Lakers. And pretty soon they became, uh, you know, Clipper fans, which was great. But, you know, L.A. is a huge metropolis. There's plenty of room for two basketball teams, two baseball teams, two hockey teams, two MLS teams. Uh, two major college uh, athletic programs in USC and UCLA. It is just a, a, a giant, giant uh, metropolis. And so there's plenty of room. But uh, I, I think it's true, especially since Steve Ballmer has owned the team, that their competition is not the Lakers. Their competition is the other 29 teams in the NBA. And uh, they, they've reached a high level. Uh, in, in, in that grouping, they haven't gotten to the top yet. Uh, there's always something, an injury here or there, and they're having injury, pro injury problems again this year. But talent-wise, they are as good as any team in basketball right now. If they can just get them all out in the court together between now and the middle of April. Uh, follow up to that, how meaningful would a title be to the franchise, to the fan base that is, has been awaiting that? I mean, are we seeing an NBA equivalent of like the Chicago Cubs or maybe the Cleveland Indians when they won a few years ago? Um, how meaningful would that title be to that franchise? Well, it would be huge, but I, maybe not as huge as the ones you're talking about as comparison, because you get one title, the Lakers already have 17. So you probably need to get 18 mm. uh, to, to really you know, top the Lakers and, and have people say the Lakers are the, are the, the little brothers now uh, to the Clippers. But, but one would be great. I, I would just love it for the fans. I would love it for this ownership group and management group. They, they worked so darn hard uh, and, and tried like crazy to, to, to do it right and to make this a, a – a perennial winner, and with the the new arena just a little over a year away now, uh, I think they can really become uh, one of the great franchises in all the sports. And the championship would be the crowning touch. And I hope, most of all, for the fans' sake, I hope it happens because the fans have been so great, so loyal for so long. It, when the team was lousy every year, it had no chance to win. The fans loyally hung in there and uh, we're just absolutely great i i miss the fans they, they're a marvelous breed and a unique breed i think I, I was hoping also to have you kind of talk us through the shift that happened with the clippers at, at least from justin and my perspective from us watching the clippers in in the 2000s you know there seemed to be this inflection point where blake griffin you know joins the team you have like this this whole lob city um going around there's much more excitement then chris paul joins the team and and you have i think for the first time at least for what justin and i have seen of of like this title contender legitimacy narrative tied with the clippers um what what did you see in the early days broadcasting for that franchise and and like how did that move did you see a specific inflection point like that or were there a few others along the way yeah i, I think it's kind of a a progression i, I think that bringing Mike Dunleavy in. Mm. He was a coach when they got uh, Blake Griffin. Uh, Dunleavy was a, a solid, uh, accomplished uh, head coach. I think he helped raise the expectation, the reasonable expectations for the franchise. Uh, Benny Del Negro did a nice job uh, succeeding him uh, for two years. I can't imagine why Benny didn't get a job again. He won 56 games for the Clippers franchise record uh, got let go uh, for Doc Rivers and has never gotten a sniff. Uh, I, I, I do not understand that one. It's a but great then, point. Yeah, true. Yeah. Bring Doc in <clears throat> was uh, a, a big step forward. Uh, he was a championship coach and uh, he had a championship level uh, roster. I thought his first year was his, his best year, uh, his best team. Uh, 
the owner found a way to screw that one up in 2014, uh, unfortunately. But then the new ownership, uh, the sky is, re remains the limit. Uh, whether or not the, the pairing of, of George and Leonard is the pairing that's going to lead them to the championship, I don't know if that's the pairing or if it'll be some future pairing, but, but they're going to figure it out. And uh, they're, they're going to compete for titles for years to come, I think. Ralph, you have such a wealth of knowledge and just broadcasting games. I want to ask you about the broadcasters now. What stands out to you in terms of either the radio or television broadcast? Are you seeing any observations in terms of things that either concern you or impress you just about the evolution of calling a basketball game? It could either be the NBA or college, like in terms of the announcers that you're seeing nowadays. Well, I, I watch games all the time, an NBA League Pass and all the other games that are available on the network, and I wind up probably grading the announcers more than I do evaluating the talent on the, on the court. And there are some very, very good ones, and there are some that I think are difficult to watch and, and listen. Uh, I, I don't like cheerleaders. I don't like screamers. Uh, Vin Scully doing baseball was the best there ever was uh, in any sport. Uh, and he never screamed or shouted once in his life. His <laughs> Uh, classic call of the Kurt Gibson uh, home home run. Uh, he, he had a minute and I think it was 17 seconds of silence after he called the home run and just let the crowd and, and the, the viewers and listeners enjoy and savor the moment. Uh, today's announcers so often think they have to fill everything and talk about it and uh, show off their knowledge about analytics and stuff. Analytics are, are good to know because they can tell you that this guy's a really good shooter in the left corner. Uh, but I don't care that he's shooting 42.3% there and only 41.7% in the right corner. That, that doesn't mean just he, he's a better shooter in the left corner than the right. You really got to get out on him and, and take that corner shot away from him. That's all you need to say or know because you may know this knowledge, but so many of the guys that they just have to show it off. That, and, and some some of the beat writers doing <clears throat> doing the same darn thing. I don't think the average fan uh, cares near as much about analytics as they do about winning and losing, and who's who's doing great and who's not doing great, and the plus and minus and all this stuff that just gets worn out. Uh, I, I listened to uh, Pete Branica do the Memphis Clipper game a night or two ago. And, and he was just terrific. Uh, he, he enthusiastic for the for the Grizzly team, but not over the top crazy when somebody makes a slam dunk in the first quarter. So it's, that's just is, me. Is that hard to contain your emotion though when you when you were calling games in the Clippers? There's some big moment. And did, was there a battle within yourself to keep your composure? How did you kind of reconcile your emotions when maybe inside your feeling is for the Clippers, but you, you get to keep to your philosophy? Like, how did you can maintain that battle? Well, I never got paid to win or lose. I got paid to come up with a uh, interesting, informative, entertaining uh, broadcast. Uh, and that was always my focus. Uh, there were nights where my wife was a, a, a tremendous uh, fan. Uh, would say after a game the Clippers had lost, you'd be oh, oh that was awful. They how they lose that game. I said we had a great telecast. I feel I feel like really good. Uh, so I, I really react reacted more to the quality of of our shows than I did uh, the team winning or losing. Yeah, to your point, sometimes with the analytics, I I do feel like I notice when I'm watching League Pass if there's too many numbers, if if there's too much going on on the screen in, in terms of data. I mean, sometimes that can be very interesting, as as you said, uh, but sometimes it can feel like math homework, too. <laughs> I find that might be a point where I'm, I'm checking my phone <laughs> during the game or, or something along those lines. So really just focus on delivering a quality broadcast and a quality product was, was always priority number one for you, it sounds like, Ralph. Priority number one, two, three, and four. In terms of the amount of variety that there there are with broadcasts, I mean, do you do you see it as as like a positive thing that like every team has 
you know, their own broadcast team that we have all these extra options? Is it, is it maybe more than, than what we need, um, for those broadcast options or, um, I, you know, there's been on our show, we've talked about a few times, uh, teams starting their own streaming services, uh, for games. And do you see that kind of changing to be maybe a more individualized fan experience as we move forward? Well, it will be because so many fans are watching games in very, very different ways right now. Uh, Steve Ballmer, the owner, owner of the Clippers, I visited with him when I was in California on the book signing tour, as a matter of fact, in November. And we're talking about Valley Sports, and he said, well, they won't be here. It might be three weeks. It might be three months. It certainly won't be three years. Uh, he said, they're big trouble. And well, since now we're, they, they've gone bankrupt and yeah. all of the regional sports networks are on their, their last legs. And Bomber's been ahead of the, the field here, I think, in looking at streaming and whatever, maybe some, uh, no, we haven't even thought of yet, means of watching games. Uh, so many games aren't being watched on that television set in your living room anymore. Like, it was always the way you would watch events. Now it, it might be on your telephone, it might be on your computer. Uh, God knows how it might be. But uh, there's something around the corner. I'm not smart enough to know what it is. I think Steve Ballmer is smart enough. I think Slipper fans will be very, very fortunate because they're going to be at the cutting edge of whatever opportunities are out there. One last question for you. How has Steve Ballmer's ownership changed to Clippers? He just seems to be very, uh, compared to other owners in the league, very technologically savvy and yeah. very much on the cutting edge of just evolving the fan experience. Um, how has he just changed to Clippers and just your observations, you think? Well, he we came from Microsoft, so it's no wonder yeah. uh, those things. Uh, it's changed in every way. Uh, his, his first meeting with the staff was before the ownership was even uh, formally approved by the league. Uh, but he had the, the entire staff, basketball staff, front office staff, sales staff, everybody, uh, at a big luncheon at, at the, what was then Stable Center. And he made a very, his, my name is Steve. I'm not Mr. Bomber, which was such a contrast to Sterling who would fire you if you called him Donald wow. or even DTS. I mean, it, it, I think his wife had to call him Mr. Sterling. Uh, so this guy said, I'm Steve. And he gave out uh, his personal email address, his personal cell phone address, and a business cell phone. He said, if you want to get something done uh, personally, call me on my personal cell phone. Otherwise, use the, the business line, send, send a text or send an email. And people were like, oh, my God, this is a whole different world. And it just changed the, the attitude of everything. Now, there were some people that were longtime employees that it, it, it didn't work out with the, with the new management group. And so they, they had to make some changes. And, and it, that, that was awkward from time to time. But now they've got the right team together. They're all pulling in the same direction. And... Uh, it, it, it's. I, I had a friend tell me uh, years ago, the strippers that have an Elton Brand, Sam Cassell, you know, Corey McGetty, pretty good looking core. And I said, I get all excited. They're, they're going to do it now. And they say, Ralph, there's no way they can't win as long as Sterling is the owner. And then with a the Lob City group, said, oh boy, they're going to do it now. And they said, Ralph, they can't do it as long as Sterling is the owner. And that was so proven in the middle of the damn playoffs. Uh, the whole thing blows up and he gets banned from basketball for life as well. He should have been. But uh, with that owner, there was no chance to win. With this owner, there will be every chance to win. And I, I can't wait to see it happen. Ralph, this has been a fantastic chat. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us and our listeners and viewers. Uh, please let's let our audience know if you have any new projects coming up or anything else you want them to be on the radar about. Well, I'm, I'm working on a new book uh, on the, the uh, parody of black athletes and white athletes and the history of pro sports in the country, going, dating back to 1900. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be stopping. I'm going to drive cross country here in a week or so at the Negro Baseball Museum in Kansas City, Missouri. 
uh, I just think it was an interesting story to be told uh, from, uh, from 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 boxing, from football to baseball, hockey, everything. Uh, how how the racial aspects have changed, and uh, and for the good. Happily. Thanks, Ralph, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, fellas, thank you very much. Keep up the good work.